guys welcome back to my channel and to another whodunit wednesday so today's case is an unsolved one it's about a boy called nicholas barclay who went missing in 1994 only to turn up three years later but after being reunited with his family not all was as it seemed so i'm gonna go into the disclaimer this is just all the information i've gathered from different online sources which i've compiled into one video this is not meant to disrespect anyone and i've tried my very best to make sure all the information is 100 percent accurate so with that being said let's get into today's case nicholas barkley was a 13 year old boy from san antonio texas he was born on the 31st of December 1980 to his mother Beverly Dollahide. He was a light brown to blonde, kind of like mousy head, blue eyed boy with a gap between his front teeth. He had two older siblings named Carrie and Jason and they all lived together in a small house in San Antonio. So just before I get into the main part of this case, there was a confliction to whether Jason was the brother, like I said just now, or the uncle who lived with them. I think the majority of articles did say that it was the brother, but there were quite a lot of articles that still said uncle. So just bear that in mind when I talk about Jason. Nicholas wasn't your average rebellious teenager. He had a reputation for being trouble. He had a history of verbal and physical abuse towards his mother. Police had been called multiple times by neighbors who heard screaming coming from their house. He skipped school more times than he attended and whenever he was in school, he was usually in trouble. Being so young, Nicholas already had a juvenile criminal record from threatening his teachers, stealing a pair of shoes and breaking and entering into a convenience store and he even managed to get three very illegal tattoos at the age of 13 from his friends. He had the letter J on his shoulder, the letter T like on this area of his arm between his like fingers and uh, L and an N on his ankle. I'm not really sure what these initials stood for. The J and the N could probably be for him and his brother, but again, I didn't see any reports on this. On a summer's day, June 13th, 1994, Nicholas was out playing basketball with his friends a couple of miles away from his home. And when the game finished, he rang his mother from a payphone because he wanted her to come pick him up. However, his mum was sleeping from a previous night shift and Jason answered the phone and refused to wake her up, which meant Nicholas would have to make his own way home. Unfortunately, Nicholas never returned home and this is when police were called. Now, the day after Nicholas didn't return home, he was scheduled to have a court hearing because he was facing time away at a home for juvenile delinquents, and this made authorities initially believe that he'd left of his own accord to avoid being punished. Um, he'd also run away before, but never gone for more than a day, so this made police a little bit slow to take this seriously. As the days passed, it was clear something more unsettling had gone on because a search of Nicholas's room showed that he hadn't taken any of his belongings or any clothes. He was also known to only have five dollars on him which meant he probably wouldn't have been able to get public transport or even find somewhere to stay. Another possibility is that he had hitchhiked because after a search of the local area uh, they couldn't find him even though the day he went missing he was wearing like bright purple shorts and a pink backpack so he should have been quite easy to spot and his mother does believe that he could have taken a ride from a stranger because apparently he had no fear of anyone. Investigators were now treating Nicholas's disappearance as a missing persons case but progress was really slow as there were virtually no leads. In the first few months of Nicholas's disappearance the police had been called to the Barclay home on multiple occasions because of fights between Beverly and Jason. Their relationship had become really volatile since Nicholas had disappeared. Three months after after the disappearance of Nicholas, the police received a phone call from the Barclays saying that Nicholas had returned and when the police arrived, Jason had told them that he saw Nicholas trying to break into the family's garage but ran off when he'd been spotted. However, after searching the premises and the surrounding areas, they found no evidence of Nicholas in the immediate vicinity and they didn't see any signs of forced entry either. 
Due to this, police didn't believe that Nicholas had returned or that Jason had actually seen him. They thought that Jason was lying and his mother thought the same thing. But the question is, why would he lie about something like that? As time went on, the investigation began to slow down and the family, while trying to remain hopeful, began to believe that they would never see Nicholas again. However, in October 1997, three years after Nicholas had vanished, police received a phone call that they never thought they'd get from a man working in a youth centre in Linares, Spain. The man stated a young boy who looked to be around 16, the same age Nicholas would be now, was found huddling in a phone box and taken to a youth shelter. He also said the boy had been kidnapped from his hometown and was now staying in the Spanish shelter. After managing to escape a child sex ring operation that was run by high-ranking military officials. This young boy was believed to be Nicholas Barkley. He was alive and healthy and in their care. After exchanging a description and identifying him from the missing person poster, his identity was ultimately confirmed as Nicholas Barkley. Police explained that he had been severely abused for the past three years, subject to experiments and forced to speak French only. The family were notified and Carrie, the sister, flew out to Spain to again positively identify the person as her brother. And the reason that Carrie was the only person who went is because of the family's limited funds. And when when she arrived, the person believed to be Nicholas was timidly waiting, wrapped in a scarf and a baseball cap. Without a moment's hesitation, Carrie threw her arms around her brother and confirmed that it was in fact Nicholas, which Nicholas was actually relieved because apparently he didn't really remember much of his past and didn't think that his sister would recognise him. He was then given an American passport. He flew back home to San Antonio to be reunited with his family. However, something was a little bit off about the situation. Most obviously, it was the fact that the boy from Spain looked nothing like the boy who went missing in 1994. Nicholas Barkley had blonde hair and blue eyes, and this Nicholas had brown eyes and brown hair. He also had a French accent, but given everything that he had been through, the family thought it wasn't so unusual. They accepted his explanation that he was forced to speak French and receive chemical eye treatments that would change the colour of his eyes. They were just happy to have Nicholas back home in their lives and he was safe and alive. So they believed him, but authorities weren't so keen on the story. A private investigator named Charlie Baker had caught wind of this story and he showed up alongside TV crew at the Barclays home to conduct an interview. The family didn't really want any attention from the media, but Nicholas seemed to relish in it. He loved to tell people his story and what had happened to him, which is a bit strange because you think after everything that had happened to him, it would be safe to assume that he had some sort of like PTSD or that he wouldn't want to relive his experiences so soon after getting home. According to Nicholas, the story was that he was kidnapped on his way home from playing basketball with his friends at the park. He was put on a plane to Europe and then forced into a child sex trafficking ring and he eventually escaped and this is when he was discovered by local law enforcement and his kidnappers had dyed his hair and changed his eye colour to stop him from being identified. While conducting this interview, Charlie Barker spotted a photo of 13-year-old Nicholas before he disappeared and he began looking at the person in front of him and just comparing the two and he noticed some alarming differences between the photo and the person in front of him's physical appearance, especially in the ears. Now, your ears are kind of like fingerprints. I mean, not exactly, but they are quite unique. They don't really change from when you are born to when you are growing up. And when comparing the photo to the person being interviewed, the ears just didn't match and Barker knew that the person he was interviewing was not Nicholas Barkley. So who was he? The boy refused to voluntarily give blood or fingerprints to positively confirm that he was Nicholas Barkley and he also wouldn't give the identities of his kidnappers. The imposter lived with the family for six months until the police managed to get a court order to test his identity and fingerprints 
identified the man as Frederick Pierre Borden, a 23 year old French citizen posing as Nicholas. Borden had a criminal history in Europe and he was dubbed as the chameleon because he had taken over 40 false identities before taking the identity of Nicholas. Everyone was shocked, but what were his motives and how did he manage to convince the family that he was their son and brother? According to his account, it all happened by chance. He first heard about the missing American teen when he was thinking about going under the ruse, when a security guard actually said the two looked quite similar to each other. Frederick Borden built up the charade by gathering as much information as he could on the case and changing his appearance to make him seem younger. So from this, we know that Frederick is a liar and some would say he's quite a good one. He himself even says, I'm a manipulator, my job is to manipulate. However, he claimed that the family actually knew he wasn't Nicholas and there was a sinister reason behind this. He said that the family knew who'd killed Nicholas and they were just playing along to try and cover it up. They never thought that Nicholas was coming back. He also stated that it was clear that Jason knew what had happened to Nicholas. Another thing to mention is Beverly had taken multiple polygraph tests to question her knowledge on the disappearance of her son and she passed two but she completely flunked one and this made the results inconclusive. Polygraph tests are usually not admissible evidence anyway, so you couldn't use it as evidence in court one way or another. She also refused to give blood samples to aid in the investigation, claiming that she knew that it was her son, which led police to believe that she may know where he is. The family, however, say that in their distress, they so badly wanted to believe that it was Nicholas that they just did. Charlie Parker wanted to look into the possibility of foul play in the disappearance of the real Nicholas Barclay. He took it upon himself to identify the family and in particular paid a lot of attention to Jason. However, just days after police started to pursue Jason, he died of a drug overdose. After the truth of Frederick was revealed, he pleaded guilty to passport fraud and perjury, admitting that he had posed as Nicholas when he found his information from from a missing persons center. However, he made several contradicting statements about Nicholas, saying that he'd met him before in Spain and that he was alive, then going on to say he had proof that Nicholas was actually dead, and then going on to say that he had never met him at all and didn't know anything about the case. Frederick Borden was sentenced to six years in prison, and this may seem small, but it's actually more than three times what the sentence guidelines suggest and this was due to the harm that he had caused to the family. Nicholas has never been located and with no evidence and no leads, the case remains unsolved. And while it's hard to believe what a serial imposter and pathological liar like Frederick says, it's also hard to believe that the family thought that he was actually Nicholas. Could their grief and hope truly have blinded them into thinking that he was Nicholas or were they afraid to admit it wasn't because they'd killed him? Beverly was actually a reformed heroin addict and she stopped using once Nicholas had disappeared. And some people believe that maybe she stopped because her and Jason accidentally killed Nicholas while she was on it or even that the reason she didn't want to give blood and failed the polygraph test was because she'd started using again. But as I said, these are just theories. And also the tattoos, surely they either weren't there or they were placed or looked a bit different. So why after being told that he was an imposter did they still believe that Frederick was Nicholas? The phone call Jason made to the police in 1994 was also not too uncommon. Police explained that this is actually a tactic people use to convince the police that someone is still alive. But like I said, there's no evidence to prove that the family has had anything to do with Nicholas's disappearance. And I also wanna add, after Frederick was released from Jail. He ended up getting married in 2007 and having children. And that is the end of today's case. I'd really like to hear your guys' thoughts in the comments. I think this case is very sad, but also insane that someone managed to pretend to be someone's son and brother and get away with it. So yeah, just let me know your thoughts in the comments and I will see you in my next video. Bye.